good afternoon. I am Marissa Parham. I am, a, I am a professor of English at Amherst College. I'm also the director of Five College Digital Humanities. Um, this semester, or right now, I'm so excited to have our last speaker of the semester, Dr. Misha Cardenas. Um, as you know, we have a very thriving speaker series, and I think this is a perfect way for us to sort of launch ourselves into like the wild, dark slash creative period known as January. Um, <laughs> I think it's really, we were thinking when we were planning our series, um, of how difficult it is for everyone or for anyone to sort of focus at the end of the semester because there's so much happening. And then we realized with this speaker we were going to be okay because people are going to want to be here and people are going to want to see this. So I have a sneaking suspicion. We're excited for the shining light today. Um, let me read a little bit of your bio. Dr. Misha Cardenas is an artist and theorist who, amongst other things, studies um, trans and transgender of color movement in digital media. Um, movement in this includes migration, performance, and mobility. Cardenas completed her PhD in media arts and practice in the School of Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California. She's also a member of the Artist Collective Electronic Disturbance Theater 2.0, and her solo and collaborative work has been seen in museums, galleries, biennials, keynotes, community, and public spaces around the world. I have a sneaking suspicion, or hopefully I hope, that many of you are already familiar with her amazing work, and join me in welcoming her to learn more today. Your planet is dying, and I want to invite you all to join in and participate in a small experiment in post-apocalyptic collectivity. So I want you all to make the decision about what to do next. And one person will have to come up here carefully because there's precarious cords. And click the mouse and make the choice of what to do next. So your planet is dying. You can choose to stay and help or go to the ice planet. Take your time. You need a leader. But you have to click stay and help. Don't click on the ice planet. <laughs> okay, you have to go to the other side. Don't trip on the cord. <laughs> Complicated chords. Thank you. Okay, wait. So you have a mandate to click stay in health. That's my professor. So, <laughs> um, so stay in health. Yes. Stay in health. Okay. Don't feel pressured. I really, I just. I need more. But maybe <laughs> this. <laughs> maybe our planet is dying and becoming an ice planet, and so oh. it's like six of one have to. <laughs> So it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. Given that it doesn't matter, should we stay in hell for yeah. a minute? Yes. <laughs> yes? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I thought I could stay and save her, my planet. I thought I could just drop everything and stay and care for her and help her live a little longer. But then I realized how sick she was making me how she's been sick her whole life, and I felt pulled to stay, even though I wanted to go to the stars and have a new, unimaginable life. So I tried to stay, but the air was thick with chemical smells. The smell of human waste, the acrid chemical cleaners to cover it up, the smell of an atmosphere of resignation, and I couldn't breathe. And the people couldn't talk to me, they couldn't make any sense, and I felt like I was losing my mind, and finally I was nauseous and I could barely move. Then I realized what I was doing when my lover, Gora, said to me, Roja, I feel like you're always trying to get me to stay. I had to leave and go into the stars and find a new planet in a new universe and let my planet die and live my own life. You can choose to go to the ocean moon or go to the ice planet. Ocean moon! Ocean, ocean moon! moon. <laughs> 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 That's a cliche, but it wasn't We're probably getting another chance to go to the ice planet. <laughs> I feel like all roads lead to Rome slash the ice planet. Exactly. <laughs> so. 
Out for the chords. <laughs> to the moon. Thank you. I'm always leaving, thought Roja as she packed hurriedly. You can pack your hormones, see where you've been, or see where you're going. Wherever we've been or wherever we're going, we need hormones. Oh, now the sound works. Amazing. She went through her drawers looking for her hormones, packing hurriedly as usual. She has a tendency to do things in a blur, to not really think about them, try to get them out of the way. Packing was definitely one of those things, which meant she often forgot something essential. But this time she wouldn't forget her hormones. She was in an in-between place again in more ways than one. The current place she was living wasn't working at all. She was living in a place that often swirled with chemical fumes and left her mind foggy. She often found herself by midday unable to do anything but scroll glowing data feeds, wondering where she was and what she should do. The ocean moon was a place where people worked on their power, whatever helped them survive this place. Light shifting, portal jumping, spirit pain, time travel. Time away from the ice planet gave them a moment to rest, breathe, recharge, and hone. Will you prepare for your trip or just go? I thought I can just get an extra shuttle off moon for a day, but that would eat up precious time. How will you get your hormones on the ocean moon? Will you borrow from a friend or use DIY biopiracy bio through body hacking? Borrowing hormones from a friend is also important technology. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you think, you think that the, the danger level is already... It's already at a point where it doesn't... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. She decided to go ahead and figure it out as she goes, as usual, throwing the box of packaged estrogen into her suitcase and grabbing her other bottle of hormones. Will you catch the shuttle or let Cora know you're leaving? So are we gonna let her know? Yeah, it's yeah. yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> it's a lot of the what if there's just a Google moment? <laughs> 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 Thank you. 
I'm going to stop this performance of Redshift there, since you've already heard a lot of that, me reading it. Thank you. Thank you all for your enthusiastic participation. You do get rewarded with this video if you choose to let Cora know, so good choice. <laughs> Okay, so now I want to talk about a few things and then come back to showing a no newer piece of art that I've been working on at the end. Um, so thank you so much to Marissa for inviting me and Jeffrey and everyone who worked on my uh, visit. I really am very grateful to be here. And I want to acknowledge that we're on unceded in stolen land of the Pecumtuk peoples, I believe that is true, unless someone else wants to give me a different tribe name. That's what my short amount of research shows. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. Abenaki. Okay, thank you. Um, but I think that context of colonization is important for my work. Um, also, towards the end of my talk, warning that there will be racist language and imagery from other people, not from myself. Um, okay. So uh, just to contextualize my work in the series, I just want to briefly mention my earlier writing about the transreal. Um, in the, this book, The Transreal, I proposed that there's a similarity between transgender people's experience and the experience of working in multiple realities. And I looked at artists that are doing that uh, in different ways. And that was based largely on thinking that I had done when I did this project called Becoming Dragon, where I lived in Second Life for 365 hours as a dragon. And I uh, used a head-mounted display and wrote code for this motion capture system so that when I moved, my dragon avatar moved. And I did that to question the one-year requirement of real-life experience that trans people have to fulfill if they want to get surgery to ask, could you have one year of second life experience and then get species change surgery? Um, and so based on that, I proposed three methods of trans real aesthetics. One being explicit reality construction, so artists that do alternate reality games. Um, another being trans real identities, like the way our identities exist both in reality and also in virtual realities like Second Life or Facebook or Twitter. Uh, and uh, transreal technologies, um, looking at speculative computing, speculative futures of computing. Um, but my more recent work is looking to learn from trans of color experience in a different way. And so I'm going to read some of that work now and then should talk about my most recent project. Okay. On October 6th, Keith Sha Jenkins was shot and killed in Philadelphia, becoming the 21st trans woman killed in the U.S. in 2015. In 2014, we saw trans women of color gaining unprecedented mainstream media visibility, and this increase in visibility has coincided with a dramatic increase in the number of murders, up from 14 murders in 2014 to 21 this year. While marginalized communities have often struggled for visibility, for trans women, increased visibility may mean increased violence and increased surveillance. So I ask, how can strategies for social change be developed that can build safety and solidarity for communities such as trans women of color who often desire invisibility? So in this talk, I look to media art to develop a trans of color poetics that can open possibilities of life for trans people of color in movement, where movement includes urban mobility, transnational migration, performance, and social movement. And I'm talking about, I'm proposing a trans of color poetics. I'm not trying to say that these theories apply authoritatively to all trans people of color or all trans people of color's decisions about politics and poetics. So discussing media made by contemporary artists as well as my own practice-based research projects, local autonomy networks, and Unstoppable, I engage in a hybrid theory practice approach informed by media studies, transgender studies, and performance studies. So there are three registers at work in this talk for you to keep in mind. One is a philosophical consideration of material and conceptual operators. The second is a consideration of methods of practice-based research. And the third is a discussion of material experiments in a technological artistic milieu. 
So I propose two operations in A Trance of Color Poetics, the stitch and the shift, to add to the ideas of the cut and the fold, as described by Gilles Deleuze, Joanna Zelinska, and Sarah Kember. So I'll first discuss the shift, a method of modulating visibility, and then move on to the stitch, an operation of trans of color poetics that can use algorithmic methods to challenge algorithmic surveillance technologies in order to contribute to the survival of trans people of color. So Laverne Cox has described the present moment as a state of emergency for trans people, which invites a further consideration of necropolitics. So in his 2003 essay, Necropolitics, Akhil Mbembe offers a response to <laughs> Foucault's biopolitics from a global South context. Mbembe states, contemporary experiences of human destruction suggest that it's possible to develop a reading of politics, sovereignty, and the subject different from the one we inherited from the philosophical discourse of modernity. Instead of considering reason as the truth of the subject, we can look to other foundational categories that are less abstract and more tactile, such as life and death. Mbembe argues that contemporary governance gains authority not only through the promise of life, but also through the guarantee of death for populations deemed undesirable. So whereas Foucault proposed that sovereignty comes from governments promising safety and security, Mbembe is shifting that to say contemporary governments actually offer safety and security for some people and guarantee death for other people. And it's significant that he's writing from a South African context. So I propose, so based on this, inspired by this, I propose Trans of Color Poetics as a poetics of media and movement that works to increase the chances of life for trans people of color and reduce the likelihood of death. Mbembe describes invisible killings as one way necropolitics operates today, and the fact that only 10 of the 21 trans women murdered this year have even been investigated makes clear that this framework is useful. Queer of color, trans of color, and transgender studies have long been concerned with issues of invisibility and visibility. I agree with Kara Keeling's claim that academic studies that seek to locate queer and trans people are often problematic. She says, she writes this essay about a person named M, and she says, a looking for M that begins by asking where she slash he is now inevitably operates by harnessing the capacity of those temporal structures and epistemological enterprises of policing and surveillance inherent in any framing of questions of representation and visibility. So I, I note that to like put in this caution, this danger in terms of how we write about marginalized people and people targeted surveillance and that we might be reproducing those dynamics in our scholarship and that I'm trying to not reproduce those dynamics. Frank Alarte is another scholar writing about trans people of color, specifically trans Chicanas, and he points out the need for, quote, exploring what is unannounced, listening for the iterations of silences, which resonates with my approach to understanding modes of invisibility and imperceptibility. I also take inspiration from R.N. Izura's claim that invocations of invisibility and dehumanization don't quite tell the whole story. We cannot theorize a trans necropolitics Arhan says, we cannot theorize the trans necropolitics without exploring the mobility of gender variant bodies and the circuits of capital they slash we exploit and are exploited by. Similarly, I claim one cannot theorize the trans necropolitics without considering, and in this case centering, the forms of movement that constitute survival strategies of trans people of color and allow them to escape death every day. So I want to show this one example of a from an artist named Jeanne Monet. Plot knife housing. I know. Plot knife housing. So we see here the shift, the shift created by the cut and the algorithmic computer generated imagery of the morph. The android reaches their hand up to their ear, inputs a code and flickers from white to black. I, I am using they pronouns for this android because Monet says that this character's gender is android and that they only sleep with androids because they're more reliable. <laughs> Yet, this is, uh, they, in this video, they could be said to be hacking the black and white binary. 
Yet this is more than a binary transition as they are flickering from a white artificial skin of plastic or metal to a human brown skin of an African-American woman. The crossing here is in multiple planes, and by slowing this video down in digital video editing software, one can see it also includes a slight movement and a slight change of shape. The scene is quick. It's just a second at the beginning of Many Moons, the introductory video for Janelle Monae's extensive three-part concept album, Metropolis, a post-apocalyptic science fiction emotion picture, as she refers to it. Yet what is important here and what I'm interested in are not the states before or after the flicker or the shift, but the ability to modulate visibility that we see this android having. So modulating visibility, which may include changing one's form, location, or appearance, may be called shifting. So the android here, Cindy Mayweather, is being hunted, a fictional account which may refer to the frequent murders of black and gender nonconforming people in the US today. Janelle Monae has stated that the main character of, uh, character of her third album, The Electric Lady, could absolutely be a transgender woman. So on June 9th, 2014, soon after that interview with Monet, Laverne Cox was featured on the cover of Time Magazine in an article titled The Transgender Tipping Point. As the article's title conjures, many people saw this as a historic moment indicating a widespread acceptance of transgender people. And the event was made possible by a black trans woman who came to fame through Netflix, a digital streaming video service on the internet. Yet in the following month, four trans women of color were murdered. How can one understand the moment in which a trans woman of color is being hailed by so many as advancing civil rights for transgender people, while trans women of color continue to be the number one target of murder and violence amongst LGBTQ people in the US? And black trans women continue to be the most targeted group within trans women of color. Time Magazine's formulation of transgender rights as the new civil rights implies a post-racial notion that the struggle for, struggle for civil rights for black people is over and being replaced with newer struggles like transgender. Additionally, this creates a false teleology that figures transgender as a new phenomenon, which it, it is not. How can one develop a trans of color poetics that can work for justice for trans women of color when this category is in itself an assemblage of two categories, each with their own shifting historically and geopolitically situated borders? So I argue what enables this violence to exist simultaneously to the discourse of an emerging transgender rights movement is a modulation of visibility. This modulation can be seen enacted by oppressed peoples and also by institutions of neoliberal necropolitical power that define our contemporary moment. So a focus on the static state of visibility or invisibility is insufficient to account for what Kara Keeling has referred to as the digital regime of the image, characterized by a mutable flickering signifier. This mutability, I argue, is the specialty of trans women of color who face multiple forms of violence on a daily basis, shifting their body and appearance as necessary for survival, at one moment passing invisibly as a cisgender woman, and at another standing on stage speaking out against racist transphobic violence. So shifting, one, shifting one's visibility is a kind of mutability that's part of the lived experience of many trans women of color. But my intention here is not to imagine trans people of color as a metaphor for flexibility, which Vivian Namaste has critiqued as one way of erasing the lives of actual trans people. Instead, I'm looking to the political and aesthetic strategies of trans and gender nonconforming people of color and to artists who use similar strategies to better understand methods of modulating perceptibility that may aid in the project of reducing violence against trans people of color. So the shift was one such operation. The stitch is another. And the stitch is at work in a trans of color poetics when artists stitch clothing, social bonds, code, or concepts together with the aim of reducing violence against trans people of color. So let's... <coughs> move to the stitch. Okay. Um, so Deleuze and Guattari write in What is Philosophy? Philosophy is not a simple art of forming. Oh, sorry. Philosophy is not a simple art of forming, inventing, or fabricating concepts, because concepts are not necessarily forms, discoveries, or products. More rigorously, philosophy is the discipline that involves creating concepts. To create concepts is, at the very least, to make something. So I'm thinking here about making in multiple different ways and about stitching, both as a material and conceptual 
operation. So physical bodies in the contemporary world are tracked through networks, biometrically analyzed, and electronically surveilled, and often the results of these forms of observation is violence. I propose that an understanding of bodies as networked and racialized gender as algorithmic is useful, useful for developing a viable strategy for ending violence against trans women of color. In their book, Life After New Media, Sarah Kember and Joanna Zielinska look at the relationship between bodies and their surroundings in order to, quote, make a case for a shift from thinking about new media as a set of discrete objects to understanding media old and new in terms of their interlocked and dynamic processes of mediation. And here I understand processes of mediation to include digital communication networks, electronic surveillance, and medical surveillance, among others. So I find Zelenska and Kemper's book really important. A lot of my book is responding to their work. And uh, their basic claim is that if we want to talk about new media or, uh, or even digital humanities, that we don't have to talk about specific objects like laptops and iPhones and specific technologies like that, that it might be more fruitful to look at the fields of mediation that surround us and envelop our lives at all times, like surveillance, medical surveillance, Wi-Fi networks, cell phone networks, things like that. So they ask, Zelinska and Kemper ask, what is an ethical act in a field of mediation? And they look to the cut as such an act that's both material and conceptual, saying, quote, the practice of cutting is crucial not just to our being in and relating to the world, but also to our becoming with the world, as well as becoming different from the world. Yet they're cautious to state, quote, one must be careful not to impose a moral equivalence between all practices of cutting. For example, slicing someone's face with a knife in a street attack, remodeling someone's face in a cosmetic surgery situation, or metaphorically cutting an aspect of reality with a still or film camera, cutting inevitably entails some degree of violence. So Zelinska and Kemper's reference to the possible violence of the operation of the cut inspired me to look for new operations for conceptualizing the poetics of anti-violence. So I propose the stitch as a material and conceptual operation to add to the cut as discussed by Zelinska and Kemper and the fold as discussed by Deleuze in the fold. Deleuze considers the work of Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, which combines both calculus and philosophy to elaborate the operation of the fold in ontology, art, and media. Uh, I will spare you the discussion of calculus. <laughs> <laughs> Informed by a material practice of making objects by sewing, the stitch describes a poetics of object making as well as a process of making new concepts, as I mentioned in the earlier quote. And as sewing is a technique of making that's been used primarily by women throughout history and continues to be primarily a task of women in sweatshops in the global south, this proposal of the stitch as a material conceptual operation can be seen as a feminist proposal, a, a maybe a trans-feminist proposal, a way of generating new concepts by learning from people who have been subject to material inequalities because of their gender, race, or geographical location. The stitch can be thought of as the basis for a theory of feminist making, which values the forms of knowledge practiced daily by oppressed people as they make their lives in the face of violence. This places the stitch in the repertoire of ideas, including methodology of the oppressed, described by Chela Sandoval, and science of the oppressed, proposed by Monique Vitigue and elaborated by the art collective's particle group and electronic disturbance theater, who I've worked with. The operation of creating objects through the stitch can indicate a means of connecting groups of people who've been formerly separated and can be seen as an abstraction of the work of women of color feminism, which sought to bring together women across racial lines. Mm. So lastly, the stitch resonates for trans people who choose to undergo surgery. Many trans people choose for many different reasons to surgically modify their body, and all of these surgeries involve the cut, the fold, and the stitch. The stitch in the case of surgery is a necessary part of healing, a temporary object that holds parts of the body together in order to allow the body to find its own sustenance in a new form. The stitch brings in the affect of pain into this consideration of creation and facilitates a change in shape or a shift. Often stitches received by trans people today are temporary augmentations in the form of dissolvable stitches which hold the body together during a time of healing and then fall out when they're no longer needed. So this idea, the basis for this idea of the stitch is an experience of stitching wearable electronic garments, yet the idea aptly describes many different creative practices, including science fiction, speculative writing, media, and art. 
The stitch is an operation which requires a tool and can be used in the process of making other tools. Okay. So I'm almost to the examples part. <laughs> I'm still giving you the theoretical background. So on tools for a moment before we get to these specific examples. In Audre Lorde's widely influential essay, The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle a Master's House, she refers to, quote, those of us who stand outside the circle of this society's definition of acceptable women, which in her writing referred to those of us, quote, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, and who are older. But I propose may also provide a space for trans women of color in women of color feminism or may foreshadow a trans of color feminism, considering that trans women of color have mostly been excluded from women of color feminism, historically. She refers here to the tools of language in academic institutions, yet her formulation is a deeply important one for anyone setting out to make technological tools in the service of social justice. I also think it's an for, for, important formulation for people doing digital humanities because there's a lot of discussion about tools and their implications and their politics and very seldomly is there a discussion of Audre Lorde's work. So the artists and designers I discuss in this talk create objects with the intention of transforming oppressive social relations. Mm, skipping some of the art history part, okay. Uh, so many artists and designers today are responding to the news about widespread NSA surveillance with tactical responses aimed at stopping that surveillance. Two artists in particular, Adam Harvey and Zach Blass, have created artworks that specifically respond to these issues. I see these projects as related to projects I've worked on which take a similar approach to changing social relations by creating new technological objects, such as the Transborder Immigrant Tool by the Electronic Disturbance Theater and my project AutoNets, Local Autonomy Networks. So these projects enact the operations I've described in ways that are not mutually exclusive. One may see Adam Harvey's project, pictured here, Stealthware, as an act of stitching that enacts a cut in the field of surveillance by drones. Harvey, in collaboration with a number of fashion designers, has created, quote, counter surveillance solutions that include a series of anti-drone garments. The anti-drone garments use the fabrics use fabrics with metal woven into them to disrupt thermal imaging used by unmanned aerial vehicles, commonly known as drones. The anti-drone garments, a hoodie, hijab, and burqa, are unfortunately priced between $475 and $2,500. Harvey states in interviews that these projects are more intended to generate conversation than, than to be practically functional. Stealthware makes visible the ways that bodies are increasingly defined by the networks of digital surveillance they're immersed in, and identities are increasingly monitored by the algorithms that determine who is to be the target of surveillance or violence, such as the algorithms that control a drone. Harvey's project demonstrates the work of a single designer imagining an object or a tool to solve a social problem, apparently without any discussion with affected groups or any social effort made to facilitate the usage of these tools. Another artist project with the intent of disrupting surveillance is the Facial Weaponization Suite by Zach Blass. The project, exhibited from 2011 to 2014, consists of a series of masks designed to disrupt biometric surveillance by scanning the faces of multiple workshop participants and stitching them together in a three-dimensional modeling software. Blass's website describes a collective aspect of the project as making collective masks in community-based workshops that are modeled from the aggregated facial data of participants resulting in amorphous masks that cannot be detected as human faces by biometric facial recognition technologies. In an interview with Newsweek, Blast points to the ways that biometric tools such as facial recognition software are being developed by police and the military to criminalize large chunks of the population and states that his concern focuses on queer people, people of color, trans people, and broad sets of minoritarian populations. So Zach Blast describes a strategy of informatic opacity for marginalized people, um, which I would say differs from my work in that I'm interested not just on the state of opacity, but on the ability to modulate visibility. So the next project that I want to mention is the Transborder Immigrant Tool, which was a collaboration between myself and uh, four other artists in the Electronic Disturbance Theater, Ricardo Dominguez, Brett Stahlbaum, Ellie Merment, and Amy Sarah Carroll. And in this project, we 
wanted to respond to the deaths on the U.S.-Mexico border, and so we created a cell phone and cell phone software that would direct people crossing the U.S.-Mexico border to water. And uh, it, we, we collaborated with groups, uh, humanitarian aid groups, who were putting water caches in the desert, which looked something like this. And we made uh, GPS maps of those water caches. And the software, when, turn, when the phone was turned on, would uh, use this compass interface and direct people to those water caches and would also give them the option of hearing poetry uh, as they were walking. And some of this poetry was sort of po poetry about hospitality, um, and some of it was poetry encoding desert survival information. So uh, a poem about how to collect dew in the morning if you need water, because the number one cause of death for people crossing the border is dehydration. Or a poem about what kind of cactuses have drinkable water versus what kind of cactuses are poisonous. Um, and I actually am not reading. <laughs> and um, so I think this project demonstrates stitching in multiple ways. One is the stitching of collaborating with activist groups, so stitching people together. The other is stitching together of code and software. So there's multiple software libraries that we pulled together in that project to make it work. And um, another was an attempt to really bridge the transgender rights movement and the immigrant rights movement, which are often separate. Um, so a lot of my writing and discussion about that project focused on overlaps of uh, experience between trans people and migrant people and discussions of transgender migrant people who are targeted particularly for violence. Um, yeah. So this project resulted in, uh, so this project I would say is, uh, our, our group referred to it as contestational design to move away from speculative design, and that speculative design has been cr widely critiqued as often being about the concerns of middle-class white men. Uh, and contestational design imagines not some like infinite field of possible futures, but in acknowledges that we are already in a situation of inequality in which contestation is necessary. So uh, as a result of this project, uh, three right-wing congressmen wrote a letter to our chancellor to say that we were guilty of the felony of enticing immigrants to cross the border. And uh, what resulted was three investigations, an FBI investigation, a police investigation, and a financial investigation into whether or not we misused our funds. Uh, and so they probably spent tens of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. to determine that our measly $5,000 grant mm -hmm. was, uh, they determined that it was properly used. Um, but they were very concerned with whether or not what we were doing was art. They couldn't understand how it was art. Um, they also didn't understand, when, when I said to the auditors that, uh, that my job was writing about queer theory in relation to the project and trans theory, the auditor was like, queer theory? I've never heard of such a thing. What's that? <laughs> and I was like, there's a queer theory course on campus. You should audit it. <laughs> I don't know if they appreciated that or not. Uh, but. Uh, so then ex exhibiting it in places like the California Biennial became a really important part of demonstrating that what we were doing was not criminal in order to protect the families of the participants in the project. Uh, so we never actually got to the stage of distributing this project. Uh, we also never felt that it was really ethical to, uh, it never felt like it was reliable enough to hand somebody and say like this actually would improve your chances of survival. So that ethical question became a big part of um, what I was thinking about next. So after working on the Transporter Immigrant Tool for a few years, I became kind of itchy, uh, kind of concerned about the way we were working on a project for communities that we were not necessarily a part of. Um, my, my dad's an immigrant, but he flew across the border. I, he doesn't know anything about walking across the border. I don't know anything about walking across the border. So I wanted to work on a project for communities that I am a part of. So I started working on this project called Local Autonomy Networks, and I was really inspired by the prison abolitionist movement. I wanted to develop safety strategies for trans people of color that did not rely on police and prisons for safety. 
So at the time I was doing a lot of wearable electronics, which is electronics that are sewn into clothing that use conductive thread and conductive fabric to have electronics that are, that are built into your clothes. Mm -hmm. So I created this line of clothing and accessories that were mesh networked. So they had wireless transmitters in them. And then I did a series of 13 workshops in four different countries, um, but mostly focusing on LA, Detroit, and Toronto. Uh, with m numerous workshops there to build uh, local networks of safety for trans people of color. Um, so I think this relates to the stitch in that there's an actual process of stitching involved and that was the project that my idea for the stitch really came from was stitching these wearable electronics. Um, and over the process of this, of presenting those workshops, I uh, I think of it as a community-based design process because I started with these prototypes of uh, wearable electronic garments and I started taking them to people in communities who I thought might want to use them and uh, very quickly learned that they were not very good for the communities that I was interested in helping. Um, for different reasons. <coughs> um, one was that, I mean, the first version that I made had the electronics on the outside, so they look like wearable electronics, which is not very useful for being, you know, safe and discreet. So the later versions had the electronics in the seams, and uh, they only had these lights that would turn on when you turned on the wireless transmitter. Um, but also I collaborated with groups in Bogota, Colombia, and Sao Paulo, Brazil, and their response was, that's cool that you can make a $100 hoodie. But if we had $100, we would buy smartphones, <laughs> and we don't, so no thanks. Uh, so instead, uh, in workshops in Sao Paulo, we did this three-day workshop um, out of which this performance was created, where we discussed what people's embodied safety strategies were and uh, how we could turn those into a performance that would practice those strategies. So we practiced in the performance was in public space dispersing and then signaling each other to come together at a moment's notice. Um, or ways of signaling each other to come together with like without letting everybody around you know. So um, the last sort of year of that project was focusing on performances that were based on strategies of building safety that didn't rely on any technology. So we could think of that as a decolonizing of technology in a way. So my more recent work is called Unstoppable, and it's inspired by Silvia Rivera's words, who said, a lot of heads were bashed at Stonewall, but it didn't hurt their true feelings. They all came back for more and more. Nothing, that's what you could tell, nothing could stop us at that time or any time in the future. So this summer, I was at the Allied Media Conference, and I was having a conversation with Patrice Cullors, who's an old friend and of mine, and we were talking about how we should collaborate. She said she had been really inspired by Autonets and had made her think about what would technology for black lives be. So at the time, she was wearing this t-shirt that said, Unstop uh, it said bulletproof on it and hashtag Black Lives Matter. She designed this clothing line with Damon Turner and Foremost that said it's called Bulletproof, and it says Bulletproof. So my response to her was, uh, well, let's actually make bulletproof clothing. Um, and there's a lot of bulletproof clothing that already exists. There's like new value added things like Reebok that have like Kevlar built in so they can charge you more money. There's uh, a lot of couture designers like this designer in Bogota who's been making bulletproof clothing. But if you start Googling DIY bulletproof, what immediately comes up is white supremacist websites like Stormfront. Um, and, uh, you know, these were hard to look at, um, but I see this project as definitely one of solidarity and definitely one where it's less hard for me to read Stormfront than for other people that experience racism uh, on a daily basis in more intense ways because I'm a light-skinned Latino person who often passes as white. And so, yeah, the Stormfront the White Supremacist websites uh, discuss a lot of details about how to prepare, and specifically what was interesting and disturbing was that they're often responding to climate change in particular, and describing, sometimes even describing like specific climate change events, like this hurricane happened and I couldn't get food, so I decided to buy more guns and more bulletproof vests. Um, but 
What is more useful is that some of them, uh, and on similar survivalist websites and a similar population of readers, they describe um, specific very specific details about what materials to stop what caliber of bullet. Um, so based on that information, I made, I started making prototypes of bulletproof clothing and uh, accessories, backpacks. And uh, I'm still in the process of working on this project, so I'm just going to end with this video and then we can have some discussion. I just want to conclude by saying that although trans women of color have been almost com have been largely excluded from art and theory historically, that our daily experience can be a useful, productive grounds for creating both art and theory. Thank you. So we have time for questions. I'm thinking. Can you shift from where you're standing, maybe if you want to moderate okay. these yes. people? Okay, yes. I'm happy to help, but I feel like those are the set of 12 for people. If you just want to do it. Yeah, I can do it. Yes. Um, seeing as though, like, your two <coughs> things are, like, identifying as a person of color and identifying as trans, but then you mentioned being, being white passing, or sometimes white passing at least like and I I think a lot about that because um, I identify as a person of color but I think I pass a lot um, how do you like when you're in spaces where there where there are these um, genderqueer trans people of color and then yourself talk like talk about being a person of color but then also being white passing and how do you enter those spaces and be in those spaces especially as an artist um Hmm. I mean, I try to acknowledge my privilege when I'm in spaces that are mostly POC. Sometimes I don't go to spaces that are mostly POC because I feel like sometimes people need space. Um, but I also feel like, especially having lived in Canada and now in Seattle, that there's a lot of people that are not European that look white. And I think that it's really important for us to acknowledge that people of color is a political identification that is an action. It's not something that is just handed to you. Um, and I think that personally, I really don't want to exclude people from people POC spaces just because they're white passing, especially since like most of the indigenous people I know are very light skinned. Um, and so, yeah, or, and like let, Latinx people like come in all colors. <laughs> uh, so I think that's, you know, to exclude people from POC spaces based on being light skinned, I think would be to exclude a lot of people that have suffered a great deal from colonization. And, uh, you know, but I also think that's why it's important to have spaces that are uh, spaces for black people or spaces for Latinx people and not just POC spaces. And also, you know, I kind of, what I try to do in my work is to acknowledge that, uh, you know, even though trans women of color are the number one target of murder, actually black <coughs> trans women are the number one target. So try to avoid the erasure that comes through the phrase people of color. Thanks for asking. Also in Redshift, a lot of Redshift is kind of like acknowledging and sorting through like complicated details about like my privilege uh, as a light-skinned person who can easily cross the border and my complicity as a settler. Um, like a lot of Redshift is about the question of like how can I be a settler and be working for decolonization? How can I, how can I be? I wrote it when I was like moving to Toronto, so it was like I'm not just a settler, I'm like actively settling right now, and, but I still very much want to work for decolonization. So how to sort out those details? Because I want to avoid this simple binary where we're like people of color are good and white people are bad um, when there's like so many more complications. Thanks. 
So I, I have a question, I think, about um, the, the methodology of art and, and the practice and then the kinds of questions that you're asking. Yeah. Um, so towards the beginning of your talk, you um, maybe suggested, if not stated, that you're interested in aesthetics as, as a form or a methodology that is particularly good at thinking about modulations of um, perceptibility or perceptivity or visibility and, and invisibility. And there's something about um, art that has the capacity to sort of think through those questions in a useful way. Um, but then also um, hesitation about um, ab about the, your, the aesthetic practices that you're interested in and that you, you yourself have done in um, doing more than representation or um, contestation. So, so hesitation about presenting a tool for, for crossing borders as something that um, could actually be useful or um, not dangerous. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, or um, you know, pr presenting uh, body armor as, as something that is um, like there's a disclaimer that it's an art project and people can sort of do with it what they wish. And I wonder if, if you see attention there um, and sort of the, the usefulness of, of art in terms of thinking through a question, but then maybe not um, in terms of affecting the change that you want to see materially. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I definitely see atten <coughs> attention there. Uh, and I try to keep that tension alive and try to keep that tension in play and in conversation with the projects. Um, I think often with socially engaged art or activist art or social practice or whatever term is your favorite of the moment, um, that audiences want to respond with reducing things to a really simple binary of like, did it work or did it not? Did it help people or did it not? Did, was there actually mesh networking transmissions or were there not? Uh, or <coughs> it, and so I try to avoid s like falling prey to that binary because I think that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of micro political change. There's a lot of ways that the transborder immigrant tool was never you know it was never like used by somebody to actually help them illegally cross the border, but it was created a lot of dialogue amongst a lot of people. And uh, when the Border Patrol was interviewed by some media agency that was like, are you concerned about this new GPS art project? The Border Patrol's response was, we know people cross the border with GPSs all the time. <laughs> it's not new. Uh, it's just <coughs> something these artists are like making, you know, he, whatever. I think that was the end of his statement. Uh, but. So in a way, it's something that we're making visible. It's like, and, a, and you know, a future that we're pointing to uh, that indicates how technology is changing borders. So I think that a lot of this work is just making things visible, uh, which I guess comes down to representation, doesn't it? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think we can escape representation. I mean, I feel like with the Bulletproof Project, um, so after this initial round of testing, we found some other materials uh, that are posted on the website that are um, cutting boards you can buy from Walmart, happen to be made of UHMW, or ultra-high molecular weight plastics. Um, and that's to protect them from knives, but so they're really good knife protection. And also, if you have two or three of them stacked together, they're bulletproof. Um, so that actually is like a much more fruitful direction for this project, because tires are really heavy. Uh, although tires are free, tires are also hard to cut. Uh, it's complicated. Um, but I feel like a big part of this project, especially having like exhibited once now and um, shown it to a lot of audiences, I feel like well, one of the most important things about this project for me is just making visible and tangible and present for people <coughs> that don't experience it, that some of us have to fear for our lives every single day and every time we leave the house. Uh, and that situation of life or death is not some like speculative thing, it's not something we're reading about, it's like an everyday situation where we really have to consider, you know, what we're going to wear or where we're going to go or for different reasons. Um, so yes, um, but I still, you know, if I'm going to get paid to do something and going to spend my time doing something, I still would like to try to work to, like, there be less murder and violence. Uh, figure, yeah. So, yes, that tension's there. Try to keep it active. Hello. Um, I was just wondering um, if you can 
um, kind of expand more on the intersectionality of being a trans woman and also being Latinx. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's definitely that juncture in those two identities. But I can only imagine the complications that come with the separa- separation of those two identities. Growing up in a very Latino household um, in the Bronx, I, I know my family is very transphobic and very homophobic at times um, just because of c- cultural beliefs, religi- religious beliefs. I was just wondering when presented with these conflicts of separation of identities instead of this intersectionality that's happening, um, I was just wondering if you can explain more about that Mm. in your experience. Thanks. Um, hmm. I... That, that is a good, hard question. Um, and I think that, you know, like I already kind of alluded to, like being Latinx is really different for so many people. Uh, in my case, I am a mixed race person. My mom's white and my dad is Colombian. So uh, they're both very light skinned. I am light skinned, light hair, and all that. Um, and so I think that gives me a lot of privilege on a daily basis to not be perceived as a trans woman of color. Um, and like I said, I try to address that in Redshift. There's a lot of like scenes where you're crossing a border and the Border Patrol just lets you go or doesn't even ask you questions, whereas they stop and detain people who are visibly people of color. Um, but yeah, so a lot of my work tries to like use aesthetics uh, and to like bring into place like um, multiple intersections or multiple different parts of a person. And so things that might seem complicated, right? So like in Redshift, it's somebody who's like trans and Latina and is a settler and has like chronic illness and, you know, but through the story, hopefully like those different parts of that person's experience become part of what the viewer experiences. Um, I mean, on a personal note, since you're talking about like family and acceptance and all those things, ironically, uh, my white mom is much more of a bigot than uh, my, uh, when it comes to gender, than my Colombian dad is. Um, nowadays, yeah, my dad has actually been very accepting, uh, and my mom not. Sure. So it's something that I'm like that you know dealing with all the time. Yes. Thanks so much for being here today. Uh, I'll speak up a little bit. Thanks for being here today. I'm like uh, just so excited about everything you shared. Um, I'm thinking about um, these really exciting concepts that you've brought to us of the shift and the stitch and um, the connections there to poetics and to technology um, and to identity and intersections there. As a trans person, I'm really excited about um, right now about um, like quantum states and mm. superpositionality mm. where a particle or some data can have all of its possible configurations existing at the same time and then maybe there's this moment of um, interaction or um, settling or perception where one uh, singular state is perceived and I guess I'm, I'm wondering what you see as like, um, although you've said wonderful things about it already, like what is poetically possible in the shift and mm. in the stitch and um, and I guess in that kind of um, superpositionality that then um, has these moments of um, you know, moderation or interaction. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I have an article about shifting that is published in the Ada Journal, and part of that article I talk about passing, and part of that I talk about quantum mechanics and uh, superpositionality. Um, I think that um, uh, I, I, now I forget the theorist's name who writes about interaction. Karen Barad. Yeah, I think Karen Barad's writing is interesting. And in relation to this, but she does like very little or limited bridging between 
ideas of quantum physics and how they apply to gender and race. And part of that, she actually really cautions about the fact that uh, there's a, a lot of danger and that people want to look at quantum mechanics and then say that those things are taking place on a non-quantum scale. Um, so I think those, com those things need to be qualified or need to be careful about them. So uh, my attempt to tie them together was through the moment of passing when somebody is being seen or by someone else, that in that moment there's like light particles that are going into your eye that might allow for multiple states to exist until a decision is made. Um, but I guess in my own work, I try to just inhabit that in-between space and like make it bigger and make it visible in different ways. Um, and, hmm. And so, and in terms of what's possible poetically with shifting, I mean, I think so much of the way poetry works is through ambiguity and through that moment where you like, if we're thinking about linguistic poetry, where you like read something and then it has lots of different meanings. Um, hmm. I'm not sure that I have a good answer. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, I look at different examples of shifting in the writing. Um, so like Jean Monnet is one example, or Redshift being another, where you know the person is shifting their geographic location. Um, hmm, yeah. Well, do you have a, a book coming out soon mm -hmm. <laughs> that will have more discussion of these things? Uh, thank you so much. Like, so much to think about and so much intersectionality happening. Um, I guess one of the things, um, so the art that you showed us was about <coughs> guns for the most part. Um, have have you positioned your art in the context, the larger context of gun violence in this country at all and how that relates? Um, hmm. I I don't think I have like publicly or on record. I mean, I certainly think that we need gun control. <laughs> I wish that I still lived in Canada where there was gun control because I felt a lot safer every day. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I see my, I, I see this, this work can hopefully contributing to that side of the dialogue that's like, hey, Shootings are a problem. Um, I mean, I see how there could be a danger that this work could be perceived as being like, whatever, people should just wear bulletproof vests. <laughs> um, and that is not how I want this work to be received. Yeah. But I also, I mean, in the description of this project, I do situate it, I, uh, I mean, I started this project when I started this project, I wasn't necessarily thinking about mass shootings, but I was thinking more globally about people who are subject to gun violence. Um, and so part of why I started making the backpacks was because people crossing the border are very often shot in the back by border patrol. Um, and you know, there's a lot of Latin, Amer Latin American artists that have done similar work in response to guns and bulletproofing um, because that is a everyday situation of gun violence there also. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was really interested in the, the interaction about the apocalypse and futures. And I was interested in like why you didn't have the choice of ending the world in terms of Frank Wilderson's terms. Mm. Um, Could you say more about this? Um, I guess like um, survival is good, but I guess like many scholars have now been theorizing this like ending the world, the social order. And I was like I, I like how you're advancing this like queer futurity and like survival and resilience, but at the same time, there's this lingering choice like we should probably end the world by now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and yeah, um, I'm just like thinking about those complications. Yeah, thanks. 
I mean, I'm certainly in. I mean, I'm certainly in favor of decolonization. So, uh, I feel like it's a larger frame for my work. Is like, yeah, we should end the nation, mm -hmm. and uh, and nations, and um, you know, have a different concept of ownership that returns the land to the people it was stolen from. Um, but a lot of my work, what I'm trying to point to is the fact that with m climate change and and like increasing gun violence, that um, what we see instant. <laughs> I'm teaching this class on speculative media and social change, and a lot of my students want to be like, so in my scenario, there's only 5,000 people left, so all oppression is gone. <laughs> <laughs> and I admire that person's um, or those students' optimism, um, but I think that what we see is actually the opposite, that with more instability uh, and less order, then people who are already subject to violence are just getting more violence. So that would be my concern in terms of ending the social order. It seems like that would probably result in more killing of people who are already targeted for violence, which I don't want. Um, you touched on this a little bit, um, saying like the point of Unstoppable is not like, oh, everyone should just wear bulletproof vests, but I was wondering if you could expand on like the who behind gun violence, because it's not just like people die because of guns, but it's like people die because of the violence that like people with guns are participating in, so whether it's white people or police, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, like do you see the the specific dynamics of who has guns and who's subject to gun violence um, playing out more in Unstoppable Network? Um, hmm. That's a good question that I think both these questions tell me that I need to research this part more. Um, but what I tried to point to in Unstoppable as it exists now, like the description that exists now, is that part of how necropolitics works and part of how the order that we live in now works is that uh, governments kill through neglect. So I think that whether there is a policeman shooting somebody or there is a non-state actor shooting somebody and then they're not investigated, then um, in many ways the government is still responsible. Uh, so I think that, yeah. That there's like a willful neglect in terms of not having gun control laws and not investigating murders that seems similar to me. Thanks. Um, yeah, and that last thing I'm really thinking about um, in terms of Mbembe, the shield stuff, and thinking in terms of necropolitics and thinking about because one thing I was struck by in your talk, and I'm sorry, it's like a statement question, I'm just sort of thinking it through and I wanted to think yeah. with you and hear your Thank thoughts. You. Um, and your work's kind of too complex to like get into questions, <laughs> you know, or to make into questions for me. Um, but I was struck by a thing you said during your talk. Um, you had a sort of a little bit of a loop moment, you know, in a normal way, when thinking about sort of representation, right? And sort of where it can and can't sort of get us. Mm -hmm. um, conceptually, but I was thinking a second strand that's more interesting in your work really is this sort of balance between thinking through visibility and invisibility. Mm -hmm. And I was also thinking about how in the work you've been doing in Unstoppable, um, what's so fascinating is like, you know, the other side of Unstoppable is that, you know, who is stoppable and how do mm -hmm. we stop? Yeah. others one and two thinking about how if you're thinking for instance about people crossing the border they already you might already have you have gps etc that whole argument that was there but then the making of art it's bringing to light the sort of material conditions of that moment the moment of crossing the border the moment of running the moment mm -hmm. of being shot at and how interesting it is that the objects you create on some level become more vocal than the actual people saying, how about you not shoot at me? Mm. How about you let me across the border? So I can't quite pull it together, but I think there's something really there about 
enabling objects to speak on behalf of people. And I actually mean it's in a positive way. Obviously, it's behind, behind it is this hugely negative thing of not listening right. um, to the voices of actual people. But in thinking about the question of which of these technologies work and don't work, there's something really important here in how easy it is to overlook, I guess, how important bringing visibility really is. Because there's something about violence, and this is one of Mbembe's points, right? There's something about violence that is simultaneous with the work of disappearing and disappearing people. But with thinking about that, is there a way to sort of, or do you have a way of sort of thinking back through the stitch and thinking the stitch alongside protection? Mm -hmm. Like, is the stitch only reparative? Or can it also be a thing that is protective? I guess it's part of it. I know it's a really, that was a stupid no, thing, a, but I'm just trying to pick up some of the things you were saying and how they came together. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Me. That was a great comment slash question. That gives me a bunch of things to say in response. One is, fortunately, this slide that I skipped, which is in response to both of you. Um, so I really appreciate Mbembe's recent writing where he says, um, you know, whiteness is not going to go away by itself. And um, that to, punctu oh, I'll just read some of it, right? To punctuate and deflate the fictions of whiteness will require a different regime of desire, a different uh, regime of new approaches of material aesthetic and symbolic capital. So I think that's really important and that's, that, that's why I'm, what I'm talking about and thinking about is poetics and not aesthetics. Because I think aesthetics has a built-in conception of a viewer who's like objective and looking at something. Mm -hmm. And versus poetics, which is actually about autopoesis, which is about creation and action. So I find poetics to be a really useful idea in terms of praxis, in terms of mobilizing a praxis, in terms of saying that the things that I want to do are a poetics of life and death. So in my choices, I'm not like choosing, I'm not neutrally looking at something and choosing like, oh, that needs more red, <laughs> um, but thinking, you know, what could I add to this project that might affect somebody's chances for life and death? Yeah. That's really, thank you. Yeah. Oh. Um, I, I was just, that made me think about um, this, this sort of desensitization that we have to things that come out of like participatory media, mm -hmm. documentation of the of actual violent acts, and how we register those versus how we might register something that actually that we know to be a fiction that we know to be crafted as art. Mm -hmm. Do you feel yourself ever like getting into this line where maybe you can do something that's more effective? Than documentation, even though there is this like reality-based thing to all to your work, it seems like it's you know. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what I'm getting at? I yeah. I just I think so. thinking like about that that line that you can cross with art that actually is more effective than at, at reaching people in particular ways than the stream of things we've now grown to sort of yeah. like place in a feed that well, turns into white noise, you know. Totally. Yes. Thank you. And that also makes me think of um, something Marissa said. And I think that part of what's useful to me about art is, come, for me, like comes from performance and performance studies and just the fact that there are rituals that kind of shape our lives and there are rituals that people are familiar with. And there's a way that when you're looking at art, you have some idea in your head that it's some different experience than when you're just looking at things on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's true, maybe that's not, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but I also think there are questions of, I mean, I think the context for things really is really important. Um, so like in that video that I showed, um, you know, there's the context of like, what is the description that people hear before the video? What do people understand about the motivations? Video could have totally different meaning if they, people didn't know the context. Um, and there's also like specific poetic or aesthetic choices in, in the making of the video, like the timing of the cuts and the transition from one scene to the next um, that I did, I made really intentionally. Um, so I wanted to emphasize for one, the ambiguity 
of that process of testing those materials, that it was not some like purely scientific process and we have like a yes or no answer. <laughs> um, so, you know, like the wind noise and, and like the reality of like, did it stop? Well, there's a bullet in there, I guess that means we stopped it. Um, and, and also the way the cuts were made, like I, you know, didn't put in transitions, I had them just cut from one thing to the next. Just a, a feeling of, I don't know, gravity or a suddenness or something. Does that answer your question? I mean, I do think that there is a lot of problematics. There's a lot, I think it's very problematic the way people share images of deaths of people of color on, on uh, social media. Uh, that it seems much somebody else recently compared to lynching postcards, and I think that is a reasonable comparison. Um, and it makes it really hard for me to look at social media, and often I just like can't look at social media because people will just like, oh, here's another video of a trans woman being murdered. Um, and it's really not doing anything for me, I, uh, and I'm not sure if it's doing much for trans women of color for people to just share images and videos of our murders instead of actually organizing. <coughs> and you know, share on Facebook the event that you organized to stop this from happening again, or the event that's a memorial, instead of just sharing the documentation. Um, I was kind of interested in uh, one thing you uh, were talking about during your presentation um, about the material and conceptual operations of cutting, folding, and stitching, and not only how those relate, well, how those relate to the process, processes involved in, in creating art and as well as um, how, how they represent different, oh, the, each of them have different meanings for trans people who are undergoing surgery and how each of those processes are gendered in a sense. Um, and I was just wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on what each of those uh, processes kind of mean in your viewpoint. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, well, so, I mean, Deleuze and Guattari talk about, they propose these operations of the cut and the fold. Um, and so that framework of operations I found really useful in terms of having resonance with both poetics and also computer programming in terms of the way like programming languages have uh, operations that are kind of like basic elements of that programming language that allow other things like the plus sign or the multiplication sign or operators or like a function call is a kind of operation that allows other things to happen. Um, so in Life After New Media, Kember and Zelinska really engage with the cut as an operation very extensively. Um, so they talk about the cut in film um, and they talk about photography as a kind of cutting and like in the example I talked about they talk about all the other meanings that cutting can happen. Um, the fold is described in the fold by Deleuze which is a challenging text because uh, a lot of Deleuze's writing he's kind of assuming the language of the philosopher he's writing about and so the fold is about Leibniz and so a lot of it is about God and the soul uh, and the folds in the soul that mirror the folds in the universe and that that's how perception happens. Um, but he also goes on to tie the idea of folding into Baroque aesthetics. Um, and I have like a longer discussion of both of those operations in the book, which you can read later. <laughs> um, and in particular, I like, there's part where I look at the cut and how mm, some of my performance work enacts a cut in different ways. Um, like performance 
is often described as like a liminal space, um, which is related to also r the ritual space that I was talking about, where we acknowledge like, okay, the performance begins now, so now we start paying attention, or now the performer starts doing the performance, and the performance has an end time. So in a way, that's already a cut in time. Um, it interrupts the time of everyday life, right? Like everyday life ends now, and now the performance begins. Um, but there's also a way that like performance in public space is a certain kind of cutting of space because you know the sidewalk is there, the sidewalk has a use, or the plaza or whatever. Um, then when the artist goes to that space and starts using it to present art, then the space is kind of transformed in a way. Um, and then I described <coughs> in the talk some of the ways that artists are trying to cut things like surveillance. Um, like with the transwater immigrant tool, we wanted to allow people to use GPSs without being surveilled through their cell phone transmitters. So the main part of that project, uh, not maybe not the main, a very important part of that project was to write software so that people could use the GPS in their cell phones without having cell phone service. Um, so I would say that was a, a way that we were trying to cut the field of surveillance. And then from there I wanted to elaborate new operations of shifting and stitching. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Also part of, uh, uh, <clears throat> one more thing about that is like, part of what I'm interested in with shifting <coughs> is that I feel like um, cutting and folding are things that, y that someone does to something else uh, versus shifting is a, like an internal process or something you do with your body. Like you move your body across a national border, for example. Um, so I think that's a kind of reveals a problem in Deleuze and Guattari's thinking that is a kind of like, in, in, as much as they're trying to resist the Western subject and the confines of the subject, I think their operations still demonstrate that like there is a subject who's acting on something else. It seems very Western and masculinist to me. Um, that, yeah, this is a pretty good segue to what I was going to ask about, um, which is just, do you ever, uh, one thing that I was thinking about with some of the earlier work that you were presenting, um, especially with the uh, uh, thermal imaging, the thing that camouflages you from thermal imaging. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so, w w yeah, which is just really, really interesting to me, especially with the high design, high price point kind of aspect to it. But um, do you ever think about kind of like s situating some of these ideas like really explicitly in like a wider historical context? Because the, this whole idea of like the face or like the eyes as a window to the soul, it's like a super Western um, c concept of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, th this and some of the other stuff you've touched on kind of hints at like uh, stuff that falls outside of that particular regime of like you need to see somebody's face. Like you need to identify them, mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that what's very interesting to me is that this is uh, something that we need to be concerned with in like a technology, like from a technologist's point of view. But it's also something that is, you know, kind of like a long-standing historical, uh, like discourse between like you know how do we identify people. Uh, what do you need to see when someone's in public? Do you need to see their face? Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I do situate my work definitely w in line with a process of decolonization. And um, <clears throat> all, this other artist also, Zach Blass, r writes a lot about uh, Edward Glissant, who's another decolonial thinker and um, writes about Glissant's idea of opacity in terms of uh, inspiration for his work. Um, and like I said, I'm really interested in uh, 
developing and studying an idea of poetics that is different from Western aesthetics. Um, so, yes. <laughs> Should I have said how? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think that one of the ways that I try to work for decolonization in this work explicitly is, for example, in the work that I've done in Latin America and with Latin American groups, is to look for no-cost solutions and solutions that don't rely on technologies that come from American corporations like Apple. <laughs> and that instead are affordable or through, are basically free because they come from embodied practice. Um, so to me that's part of challenging the contemporary situation of neocolonialism where there's a Western hegemony and countries in the global south are, mean, are kept poor. So it seems like strategies that are more affordable uh, can be used by people in the global south more, hopefully. I think we should end there. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.